Welcome to the Plant-Based Podcast. Did you know that plants are truly amazing? Not only can you grow them and eat them, you can also wear them, drink them, nourish your skin with them, and so much more. Let Ellen and Michael inspire you to love plants as much as they do, as they chat with the movers and shakers in this wonderful plant-based world. So, let's dig in. Now, we should all be cautious of caring for our environment and making small, sustainable changes in our day-to-day lives. So why not start by making some delicious changes? Stone Lee Wines create their premium wine in New Zealand, and it's made from 100% sustainably sourced grapes and is vegan certified. Stone Lee's Sauvignon Blanc expresses vibrancy and fresh flavours of the Marlborough region and is a minimal intervention wine and collaborates with nature. We have a unique discount for our listeners so you can get 20% off Stone Lee Sauvignon Blanc exclusively on Amazon using the code STONELY20. So the headline says, watercress, a genuine and perhaps original superfood. Now, let me tell you, watercress has been respected for thousands of years by many different cultures for its apparent health-giving properties. Indeed, the father of modern medicine is thought to have decided on the location for his first hospital because of its proximity to a stream where watercress was growing, and he then used it on his patients. And Roman emperors apparently ate it to help them make bold decisions. Anglo-Saxons swore by watercress pottage to spring clean the blood. And Mm. medieval Irish monks survived on bread and watercress for long periods and said watercress was pure food for sages. And a little later, Victorians believed the plant was a cure for toothache, hiccups, a hangover and even freckles. Freckles? I wouldn't want to get rid of my freckles. We are so excited to talk about this peppery salad leaf today with Tom and Amory from the Watercress Company. Welcome so much to the podcast. Um, Tom, thank you very much. To get us warmed up, however, we like to start with a quick fire question round. So this is to get everyone on the same page to get listeners to know a little bit more about you with some this or that quick fire questions. So we are just going to roll off some questions and answer just whatever comes to mind first of all. First of all, you're not allowed, basically we're saying you're not allowed to think about it. Mm-hmm. You ready? <laughs> okay, so as I'm quickly ready. as your Wi-Fi allows, <laughs> peanut butter versus Marmite. Uh, peanut <laughs> morning bird or night owl? Uh, morning bird. Peonies or roses? Oh, definitely peonies. <laughs> Do you have a tidy desk or a messy desk? A very messy desk. <laughs> tea versus coffee? Definitely tea. <laughs> Are you a paper book reader or an audio book listener? If I had the time, audio book listener. Mm-hmm. Okay, just two more to go. Dog versus cat. Oh, definitely dogs. Many of them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and beach or mountains? Uh, yeah, hundred percent beach. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Now we know all about you. <laughs> Cool. Thank you very much, Tom. So I know you're taking a bit of time out of your Spanish trip, which I think is holiday, but give us the top line. Tell us all about yourself and what you do with the Watercrest Company and a few of your credentials, please. Okay. Well, I've I've been here a long time. Anyone that's worked in the industry um, generally falls in love with the uniqueness of it. So I've been here for 23 years now, um, and my role has changed over the years. I started right at the bottom, supporting the growers. And I still support the growers, but in a slightly different capacity as I look after a lot of the business sort of um, developments and projects, but also amazing opportunities like this to speak to people about watercress. 
that's a that's really really cool and you know I just yeah I just keep thinking back like watercress is something that we can like grow but I've never grown it myself but I heard that there's been a bit of a shortage recently is that right well kind of yeah you can definitely grow it at home and when I first joined the watercress company I had not eaten watercress uh, I from Liverpool way and Liverpool was renowned for selling watercress maybe a hundred years ago but in our family we were eating uh, the kind of mustard cress which is the the type you get in the pots. Watercress was very different. It's grown in watercress beds and it's much larger and it tastes much happier. So I thought I knew what it was but I had no idea. But getting back to that point about the shortage, there are times in the year when we can struggle depending on the weather because we're outside, we're not grown in any protection, so we're really facing the elements every day. So cold weather or uh, very high wind periods can cause problems to the crop and slow it down. But generally, we're pretty lucky we can grow all year round. Mm -hmm. And why do you think that watercress often slips under the radar? Because, you know, we've had long enough with kale hogging the spotlight, haven't we? Why, why is watercress so overlooked? Well, this is it. It's it's about its notoriety. Generally, you know, products that are freely available and products like kale can be produced on a mass scale anywhere really where you've got that ability, that, that land. But because watercress is grown in these very unique, growing locations uh, which are watercress beds in areas where there's plenty of uh, spring water it's become probably quite regional so the idea of consuming watercress like the highest rate of consumption in the UK would be in Dorset or Hampshire because they're surrounded by these production areas but over the years that that has changed because we used to ship a lot of watercress going up north on railway systems that we had and it goes in an ebb and flow so post-war it was really popular then it died back a little and we had a big push in the early 2000s where we started discovering more about the health benefits and it, it goes in this ebb and flow uh, and it, it is really relevant because obviously whether you're talking about your your gut health or uh, your mental health or just generally your your body health you know whether it's the blood or your renal system watercress has a position to help everybody I was just that that it's so it is genuinely so interesting um I don't suppose I'd ever really considered it to be like a big kind of uh business if you like to ship mm. watercress here there and everywhere um and something that in in the beginning of the podcast we were saying about you know what that ancestors if you like used to do with watercress or medic medicinal uses but it wasn't until more recently was it the 1990s if i'm right that scientific research was actually seriously undertaken uh, by the british watercress industry like what what was there a shift in watercress usage or growing back then that that made that happen like just tell us a little bit about how this has all come about well health benefits of plants have been uh, passed down for generations and if we went back three four hundred years ago we would have a much more uh clearer understanding of what to eat when um, we're now going into the kind of spring period when you want to be eating bitter plants so watercress is a bitter plant along with uh things like dandelions and that is that cycle of what to eat when was something that was historically recognized and therefore diet would change with the season. I think that as we have gone more into a more holistic global supply chain, we've lost some of that identity because there is so much choice. But looking back, they knew exactly what watercress did. It was a cleanser of the blood. And if you think about the knowledge level that they had in Greece, um, when Hippocrates was obviously um, practicing medicine and teaching people how to become healthier, that knowledge in a way was probably more advanced than what we had up until probably around about 2002 when we started commissioning scientific studies to actually find out what those phytochemicals did to the body and what the relationship between the human body and vegetables are. And there are an awful lot of links because watercress particularly contains some phytochemicals that are very exciting. And it's that you can taste the phytochemicals. When you chew watercress, you get that 
sort of peppery burst in your mouth. That is the magic. And it's quite interesting to have something so unique. So I guess then it was like we must research more into it, along with all plants, really, to find out, you know, how amazing watercress is. Yeah. So, yeah. so in the early 2000s, there were a lot of uh, a lot of businesses looking to find what was special about their crop, and that that was quite advanced at the stage. So when we first came out with some studies, um, they were really picked up, and it was it was quite a new way of looking at plant science. Um, so I would say we were definitely ahead of the curve, but you know, since early 2000s, there have been so many studies and you read them quite regularly and people are becoming a lot more aware of the health benefits of an array of fruits and vegetables, which is great news. Mm, definitely. Because actually watercress, like gram for gram, it contains more calcium than milk, more vitamin C than oranges, more folate than a banana and more vitamin E than broccoli. So what do you think the barrier is to eating more? Like, um, because I certainly did, didn't have watercress until maybe my mid twenties. So, how do we get kids eating watercress, for example? <laughs> yeah, we've sort of looked at the um, trying to attract the demographic. The, the, one of the challenges with some of these uh, quite peppery, bitter plants is getting kids to eat them is 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 quite difficult because their flavor profile is so different. As we grow older, um, our needs may change and our motivation for that kind of benefit, reward versus flavor profile change is easier to do. We tend to like bitter plants more as we get older. Uh, we're looking at a slightly different kind of hit to our taste profile. And I think if anything, our, our, they think that the palate of a child is very different in its micro micro levels that initiate a lot of these flavor profiles so it's not um, it's not silly to consider that some children really just don't like bitter plants like brussels sprouts is a really common one and that that sulfur content is quite noxious to them but to be fair they don't necessarily need it at that stage but as you get older your demand for some of these uh, very specific uh, phytochemicals increases and therefore our adaptability changes. So I, I'm quite happy with the idea that it's a product that, like you say, in the mid-20s, certainly into your 30s, it, it becomes more popular. And I would say that 80% of our customers will be in that higher, uh, older br age bracket, if that makes sense. Yeah, actually, it does make sense. I hated sprites when I was a kid, but I love them now. So, you know, there you go. Um, I also just talking, just, just, you know, talking about the medicinal properties. Um, isn't watercress being used in the later, latest cancer research as well? Is that right? Yes. So there's two aspects. If you think about any plant and watercress is one of many, uh, you've got nutraceutical content, so when you were saying earlier on, it's got lots of calcium, it's got loads of uh, vitamin C and iron, gram for gram. That's the obviously the nutrient content, which is really important. So fresh crop, grown properly, has that nutrient content. Then you've then got the kind of DNA of the plant, the phytochemicals, uh, which exist in all of those kind of groups. So when you're looking at watercress, that's a brassica. It's like Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, uh, broccoli, but it just happens to be a sort of king of the greens, we call it, because it's got an exceptionally high level of this particular uh, phytochemical. And so what we learned is that when you macerate it in your mouth or it's being churned up in your stomach, that there is a very specific compound that's released called isothiocyanate. That compound has got some really interesting research um, uh, topics and so we're doing some studies at the moment with uh, a professor in Greece um, uh, it was actually in Cyprus but he's from Greece I was talking to him earlier on today and he's looking into work relating to melanoma which is very interesting because he joked about freckles but I think it's like kind of lost in translation that people would say oh it looks after your freckles but actually what he's found is that it affects the shape of the mitochondria in our cells and has an influence on the change of the cells when they're put under massive amounts of UV damage. So he's specifically looking at UV radiation, its effect on our cells and how watercress uh, mitigates that damage, if that's the best way of describing it. But 
This kind of work started in 2000s when we started to look at DNA damage as a general thing. And DNA damage is a really broad spectrum. Um, and they had all sorts of really interesting ways of explaining how watercress prevented the DNA damage, but nobody really understood the process that's happening in the cells, and that's what Mahalis is doing at the moment. So we're really excited, and where it takes us, we don't know, but it's, mm. it seems appropriate that if watercress now is a bitter plant that's good for spring consumption and we're heading towards the summer when we've gone through the winter and we've become all quite pale over the winter uh, our skin pigmentation is low you eat watercress that builds up protection so when you get into the summer you're not going to suffer from the dna damage and i you know that's the kind of way that we have to look at plants you have to say where were they why are you eating them at what time of the year and what are they doing for you and i I'm not exclusive to watercress. I believe this is the case for pretty much all fruit and vegetables. Completely agree. I know, we, I know Michael's going to ask the next question, but I have to say, I think you should do uh, research into watercress for age spots. Because obviously that's also like, you know, sun and for my own personal benefit, because I seem to have got a few more recently. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's called ageing, Ellen. <laughs> <laughs> I like to age gracefully. Maybe, maybe like we'll be seeing, we might see like some new watercress uh, face moisturiser or something on the market to help get rid of age spots yeah. because, you know, that's sun damage really, you know, too. So same thing. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. Actually, yeah, before we move on, what, is there a potential that we would see watercress in beauty products at some point there, would you say, with all of this extra research? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So there's, um, there's a, we've got obviously our growing operators as a business, but there is a, another part of our business that looks into the research and there is a sort of a healthcare business um, organisation that's got a team of specialists uh, in that field. Um, mm -hmm. And that organisation has put a patent together already, filed a patent that uh, is about extracting a particular um, product in watercress, which is it's, it's, it's sort of it's called the urease inhibitor, uh, and what it does is it, it stops um, the development of nappy rash type damage. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, so they're looking at putting that into creams or um, you know wet wipes or babies' nappies because this urease inhibitor stops that damage to the skin, um, and that that is. Again, that's just like one of these kind of byproduct opportunities. So we as a business produce this amazing fresh watercress and we harvest about say 10 centimetres. But below that, there's probably about 15 centimetres of, of really sort of nutritious roots and shoots and, and leaves that are maybe just a little bit damaged that we don't sell. And what we're looking to do is to sort of upskill that product and then take that away to a refinery, which then could be used in, in sun creams or, or treatment, skin treatment products. So, I think, you know, 20 years ago, I, I wouldn't have dreamt of that. You know, what we used to say was, oh, we've got all this surplus, let's just make loads of soup or something like that. But obviously, soup or sun cream, I think sun cream sounds much more fun. Um, <laughs> so it would be nice to finish my career on sort of creating something worthwhile, not yeah. just a soup. So. Yeah, that's awesome. I bloody love plants. Honestly, <laughs> it's, like, it's just amazing, isn't it? Plants are just amazing. Just saying. Yeah. <laughs> Ellen, you were. <laughs> They're all listening behind you. <laughs> yes, they yeah. are. I want them to grow, so I'm just always very complimentary about plants. <laughs> so Let me turn this on. <laughs> Urgent watercress order. <laughs> Can you airlift some watercress to me? 24 yeah. hours. Saved by the phone. <laughs> Sorry. Zest Outdoor Living is the natural choice for beautiful and sustainable timber garden furniture, grow your own and decorative structures. Why don't you shop Zest's handcrafted dining sets, swings, arbors, garden bars and planters, all designed to be stylish and comfortable. And they've got looks that will stand the test of time. To find your nearest Zest stockist, online retailer or to purchase online, visit zestoutdoorliving.co.uk or search Zest Outdoor Living on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Here you'll find inspirational ideas. Keep listening on in this episode for an exclusive discount code, especially for plant-based podcast listeners.
Hi guys, welcome back to Crossland's Flower Nursery here in West Sussex. My name's Ben Cross, aka Alstroemeria Ben, because the Peruvian lily, the lily of the Inca, um, that's what we grow here. It's called Alstroemeria, the Latin name, because of a Swedish baron turned botanist who went over to Chile and Peru and brought the Alstroemeria seed back to Europe in the 1700s. So quite a modern flower in terms of uh, comparing it to roses and tulips, but that's the crop we grow here. Um, if you heard me back on this amazing podcast, big up to say Michael and Ellen for having me back on. I gave you an up April update in April, so now it's May the 1st, and we are super busy harvesting the crop. Um, it's May the 1st today, and slightly overcast. <clears throat> We've just had a rain shower, but the crop is super, super healthy, and we are harvesting thousands and thousands of stems a day at the moment. We are in full flow, full season with uh, harvesting the crop. So I thought today I would uh, record again from one of the greenhouses. The greenhouse I'm in at the moment, uh, one of my sort of earliest memories, about a five-year-old, I'm walking down the centre path here in one of the greenhouses. And uh, the greenhouse that I'm walking in now was built in 88 because uh, we had the big storm of 87. And where I'm stood at the moment, there used to be lots of wooden greenhouses. Those all blew down in the big storm of 87. And say so one of my first memories was uh, granddad giving me a, a bucket and I was picking up broken glass as a four or five year old in here before the greenhouse I'm in at the moment was fully built. So it uh, gives you some idea of, of where I am today. We've also just uh, planted our tomato, tomato plants in the greenhouses. Uh, you've probably heard, heard of permaculture, but we don't use any pesticides or insecticides here at Crosslands. It's all about permaculture, biocontrol introducing biology into the glass houses to combat stuff we don't want hanging about. So we use our tomato plants as basically like a Venus flytrap for white flies. So white fly, they're naturally attracted off of the Alstroemeria plants onto the tomato plants. Naturally on tomato plants, you've got a mini wasp, a mini parasitic wasp called Incarsia, and Incarsia lays eggs inside the adult white fly. So it makes a host of the white fly, so it limits the white fly population. Uh, we also usually get a bit of uh, red spot spider mite in the summer and we use phytocelis another type of mite they're twice the size of the spider mite and we sprinkle those on our affected areas that have got the spider mite and the phytocelis hunt down feast themselves and gorge themselves on the spider mite and once the phytocelis have done eating the spider mite they then eat themselves so they don't actually harm the crop and in conjunction with using the yellow and red sticky traps for aphid and leaf hopper uh, say we're um pesticide insecticide free um so big up to say melon uh, michael and ellen for having me back on this this amazing podcast um i also run the british flowers rock movement so you may have seen that on my t-shirt on socials or whatever but yeah if you want the lowdown on the british flowers rock movement uh, you can check me out on instagram and twitter at Alstromeria ben and you can catch me on facebook uh, if you type in Crosslands Flower Nursery. Um, all part of the movement, the British Flowers Rock campaign, the movement, the messaging. I also give tours of the nursery and I give talks at garden festivals, garden shows, RHS clubs and things like that. So if you're interested in, in me coming to your club or giving a British Flowers Rock talk at a garden festival or festival or anything, uh, just hit me up on, on the socials. So uh, yeah, it's been great to give you an update here at Crosslands in May and I will see you guys again in the height of summer in June where the crop will look a lot different than it is now. The crop at the moment is looking very lush, thick, dense with uh, lots of stems and once we harvest those, say in June, the beds will be less dense and uh, yeah, I'll tell you next month in the next podcast why, um, why they don't like the summer, they don't like the heat. But um, yeah, thanks for listening and see you next month. Well, we're now going to go on to talk about how to grow watercress because tell us how you grow it commercially and if that really helps people at home to grow it as well. You know, is it possible we can grow it just in a, a bowl of water with a saucer of water below? Or if it isn't possible to grow at home, is there another plant that has a similar attribute? I know there's a land cress, for example. Would, would that work? So tell us a bit about how we might grow it at home. Okay, so yes, you can grow it at home. Um, you can, uh, it's, it's very easy to propagate. So you could take 
a, a bunch or a sprig of watercress from a bag that you've bought and pop that in some, uh, uh, some water and the roots will literally grow from the nodes. So much like the plants, Ellen, you've got behind you, you've got these multi-branching and they would produce roots from most of the nodules where the leaves, the petioles come out of. So watercress is extremely easy to propagate. It would take quite a while to get it going. Uh, and also it wants to flower in, uh, as we're getting, our days are getting longer, it wants to go to flower. But that's a good opportunity to harvest some seeds. So you can grow it later on in the year. Um, so to grow it at home is quite straightforward. There are other plants that you could grow as well. Uh, the landcress is called Barberina verna which is a different plant altogether. Watercress is called nasturtium officinale. Nasturtium means twisted nose, so you can't forget it because it's so peppery, it makes you, you know, have that uh -huh, twisted nose. Um, but the way we grow it is we're growing it outdoors in uh, gravel beds that simulate the kind of edges of a riverbank. So if you imagine not the deep water of a river, not the dry area, but that little marginal area that sits between the high and low of the river, uh, and gravelly. So these beds are flat, they're made of gravel, and we run a small amount of water through. And as the crop grows, we just get the water deeper and deeper. And we're sort of chasing up the stem because all the roots come out of the stems. So what we end up with is a plant about sort of 30, 40 centimetres high, lots of roots at the bottom, a few roots up the middle, but with water running through. The really exciting part for us is that we have been growing watercress in the same location for 120 years. And that's totally unique. It's normal in horticulture because you end up with diseases building up. But if you imagine we replace the soil with water, and that's the premise of hydroponics. So every day, millions of litres of water comes out of the ground uncontrollably. It's been hidden away for 60 years. It's all loaded up with lots of nutrients that is collected as it's going through the rocks and the sand and all of the substrata. It brings up all these nutrients. We then run that through our bed and then we put it back into the river with less nutrition in it than it, when it came out of the ground because we've harvested the nutrition. So we use sunlight, water, and the nutrient in the water. And then we can then crop six times a season, which is totally as well. So it's, it really is like the, the most productive um, in terms of its cropping cycle, but also it's one of the most productive places in in the uk for nutrition so if you actually go to a farm you, it's not unreasonable to think that this is the most nutrient dense location anywhere in the uk mm -hmm. if wow. that makes sense yeah so, yeah I, I sort of, amazing. It, it, it is quite special that's really amazing I, I'm, I, I really need to see some photographs <laughs> to see what it all looks like for sure. Um, you were saying obviously about you know being able to harvest it um, and cooking with it, and actually earlier on we you know joked that once upon a time it was you know throwing a bit of cress on a, a soup or salad or something. But there's far more imaginative ways to use watercress in cooking, isn't there? Um, and also yeah. just along that line um does cooking it reduce the nutritional value of it at all or how what do you suggest yeah good point so yeah it, it went back to the 70s they were trying to promote waterfest it was just hilarious because they put a sprig in anything they could and then they said that that's it for a while you know and that was just really the prawn cocktail phase which we love that <laughs> yeah. it doesn't really offer anything too exciting other than a prawn cocktail so we then uh, went into uh, a sort of a slightly different mode. The UK generally has a huge amount of global influence in its um, culinary availability. So that made the UK a perfect place to start looking to see what elsewhere did. And, and it's, it's consumed the world. So it wasn't difficult to actually find other alternative uses for watercress. Um, and obviously trying to find a use that respects the plant exactly what you just said how do you keep the nutrition in there so um cooking watercress for long periods of time basically damages the enzymes in the plant and this is relevant to everything that we eat so if yeah. you remember that the enzymes in a plant are needed to activate the phytochemicals and therefore anything above body temperature you're going to damage them so why consume too much too hot so uh what we're sort of saying is that 
ideally eating watercress under the damage point for the enzymes over body temperature. So things like pestos are amazing because they already um, activate much of the uh, isothiocyanate. It's a fairly cool type product. Um, but watercress is used in hot dishes. So if you go to some places like you know, Portugal or um, you go to New Zealand, they would put it in hungies in New Zealand. Um, but that product is very different. It's like, you know, sort of, it looks like celery. It's huge. It's been left for long periods. So it's slightly different. So really, you know, looking after the enzymes is really important. So it's fully available to your body, uh, but then also experimenting. So, um, you know, adding it to dishes last minute is a great way of you know, getting the kids to eat it. Because if you, if, you, if you have a salad and you put olive oil, on it, it calms everything down. You can't taste all the bitterness. Um, and quite often people would say, oh, I had watercress. It really didn't taste very peppery like it used to. And I'd say, well, you know, there's two things. You could be quite rude and say you're old and your taste buds are gone. Uh, <laughs> or you could be quite nice and say, well, I bet you put olive oil in it. And they go, yeah, we use olive oil all the time on salads. And that's the problem. It, it knocks out the heat because it, it sort of coats all of the, uh, all the chemicals. Okay. okay. Good tip. There you go. Wow. Get your kids to eat watercress with a bit of olive oil. <laughs> this, this is such a cool educational episode. Thank you so much, by the way. Um, each year, there's a watercress festival, and this episode is hopefully going out on around the 7th of May. So I think the festival is coming up in a couple of weeks. Tell us about what happens there and where the festival is and where listeners can find out more. Okay, so um, the, the festival, it's, I think it's its 19th year, 19th, 20th year. Um, the uh, event has occurred in May. It's around about the 21st of May, Sunday the 21st of May. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really the start of the summer season production. That's why we sort of... Tiny. It was just a few hundred people turned up from the village. And it's in a location called Osford, which is kind of coined as the capital of watercress production in the UK. Um, but the festival has grown over the years and it's attracted uh, more and more visitors, maybe sort of, you know, you, you could be looking at 15,000 people mm -hmm. this year because obviously things are always changing. But certainly it's, it's, it's got quite successful over the years and um, it offers, I don't know, so every, something for everybody. It's a, it's a fun family event. There's loads of um, uh, stalls there that offer products relating to watercress. There's a cookery demo. So we've got the master chef um, runner up, Charlie. Um, so he's there. He's a, a connection. He cooked with, with lots of watercress during Master Chef, and so we had to get him involved. Um, <laughs> Mark Hicks there this year. Uh, obviously, his business is in Dorset, so we got Mark coming. And and then there's lots of events on the main stage. So it's a good good fun. It's tied up with the um, the watercress line. So the, the the railway line that used to transport watercress from Alsford to London 120 years ago. They get involved, so they put on steam railways and things like that. So it's good fun. Yeah, that sounds there. really cool. cool. I honestly can't say I've ever heard of a watercress festival before, but this sounds like a really fun festival. <laughs> <laughs> it is. <It's> unique. <laughs> yeah. So just before we finish up, can you tell us how listeners can find out a little bit more about you and what you do about watercress in general perhaps somewhere listeners could look for you know what's going to happen with watercress in the future that kind of thing okay so it'll be, we have a website so there's watercress.co.uk or the watercresscompany.com mm -hmm. um those are two places uh, if you google watercress we normally can quite up you know at the top there's lots of uh, information there about recipes but there's information about the scientific studies we've done or growing methods. Um, there's lots, lots of information there. It's not difficult to find. Or you can just get in touch directly. You know, I'm sure my email is out there somewhere in the in the ether. Um, but uh, you can. I do get quite a lot of messages from people that are really interested, and we always help out. You'd be surprised at how many I re email back directly and end up with you know sort of quite a chat about certain aspects of of watercress if anybody wants to know always happy to help that's really cool thank you so much this is on it's so interesting yeah absolutely yeah. i've got this like picture now of just trays and trays of you know shingle and water and beautiful lovely green lush watercress 
coming out. It must just be such a lovely environment to be in. So um, thank you. You must be healthy just looking at it. Put it that way. <laughs> yeah, I'm at 85. <laughs> what a, wow. Get me some of that water press. <laughs> uh, well, that's brilliant. Thank you so much, Tom. The next, great place to work. I really appreciate it. Really questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for spending the time of it. Oh. So that's it, everyone. Go get your water caress, rub it on your face, <laughs> eat it, do whatever you want with it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Right, so I'll be back down here in the the greenhouse. Um, you have to excuse the background noise if you can hear it, because guess what? It is, it is raining again. Um, I mean, today is the day that you'll probably be glad that this is a podcast and, and not a video, because I, I be stood here in my birthday suit, because I recorded this on World Naked Gardening Day. Um... This weather is 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 not good for World Naked Gardening Day. Um, it's my excuse is that it's very cold in, in in this wet weather, and that's my excuse, and I'm sticking to it. If you know what I mean. So yeah, I just want to talk a bit about this wet weather because we've I think it sort of ties in with a bit of a problem we've been having in the garden here at the moment, and that is um, tulip fire, which is. Um, absolutely devastated a lot of our tulips this year um it'd be interesting to know if any of you guys have had a problem with your tulips this year i'm sure this weather hasn't helped the situation but it's been absolutely devastating um i suppose that's one of the the things you know being head gardener on a private estate and that new you do feel the pressure to make everything look good all of the time. And I mean, you know, as a gardener, you know, we we are, you know, the elements can be against us sometimes. And, you know, it can be difficult when everything's not looking fabulous all of the time. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I had a chat with the boss and he seems quite relaxed about it, to be honest, which is nice because... You know, it's hard when you, you've got someone who is, is investing quite a bit of money in buying these bulbs and then they just go and it all goes a bit wrong. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, you know, gardening is, is a challenge and don't get downbeat if things don't go to plan all the time because, you know, gardening, that's, we're dealing with nature and that happens. Um, Got to take the rough with the smooth, I guess. So... Yeah, I'll just be down in the greenhouse, just checking on the plants. Um, there's there's quite a lot gone out already. I mean, just looking across there now, got some cabbages that I should be planting out next week. Um, some Well, some kale as well, and a few other brassicas really be going out and sort of planning on, you know, getting gearing up. Speaking of the tulips, I'll try and turn the pots over for summer bedding a bit earlier this year, I suppose. You've got to be careful. You don't want to too early and get caught out by a sneaky little sneaky little late frost which would be a disaster wouldn't it i mean that'd be funny wouldn't it you know we have a disastrous tulips and then i get too keen and put the bed out and then they get frosted that'd be a blow disaster i don't think boss be too happy about that but yeah i just coming at you from world naked gardening day i wonder if any of you lot take part um but yeah just um make sure you stay safe if you're um using any power tools i mean world naked gardening day but make sure you wear that ppe keep is keep safe um uh the, while i'm here michael ellen um i i think i sent you it must be getting on for about 50 emails now about the um about meeting up for that dinner i'm still waiting for that dinner um thanks again for having me on um and if they like it they might put me on again they said so yeah just just want to say you know gardening's not easy um just enjoy yourselves out there anyway cheers then bye morning gossip live from q 
Gales. Hugh uh, Gales. Q, <laughs> Gales and Q. Um, it's so funny, Ellen, because I'm meeting you at Gales uh, today. We met at 8 a.m. at Gales and Q, and then I'm heading to Paddington next for 10:15 to meet uh, Jen, my assistant, at mm. Gales as well. Oh. Is Gales just a girls' thing? I have a really good friend called Gail. Wear her Instagram hat. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you wanted to be a Gail's because you're an influencer. Because it looks really nice. <laughs> Can I just say, if you're meeting Jen, she always looks amazing. <laughs> like, she is the coolest girl it's on like the block. Oh, we're in queue and there's always lovely cars. What is that? Because it's quite posh. Yeah. It's quite posh around here. <laughs> um, but you didn't have many vegan options, did you? Uh, no, Sorry the to only be a drama llama. No, it's fine. Usually there's like a croissant or something, yeah, yeah. but the only thing I could get was like little chocolate mm, kind of mini cupcake things. So that's croissants? that's what I've had for breakfast today. <laughs> can you eat butter? No. Oh. Okay. So you can't have a croissant. You can have a croissant, but it has to be made with like a vegan butter. Really? Yeah, that's and it's like you can and they're really good. Oh, can you yeah. get them in Norwich? You can, yes, you can. you can get them in Norwich. I don't know if you can get them in Ipswich, no. I think you can get them in even Tesco's. You get pack like, it's just not made, it's made without butter and whatever. Oh. But they're fine. So what have you been up to? Why are you here before me in a puffer jacket? I'm going to Q today, actually. Oh, Do you like my puffer Kew? jacket? Yeah, um, it's nice. Webb said that he thought I looked a little bit um, like I came from out of town. <laughs> <laughs> Uh huh. Maybe, yeah. Especially with this little pink T-shirt. But I wearing. kind of liked it. I don't mind. It's warm anyway. I'm think, going to Kew Gardens today. I think I look suitably contemporary. <laughs> I'm in a wide leg trouser, listener. Basically, I look like a tramp, and Michael looks really smart today. Yeah, but I bought these on ASOS. Look, and they've already got this thing where you have to shave off the, shave off the, wow. twinks. Buy twinks. Buy cheap. Twonks. Buy twice. What, what, what would you call that? Nobules. Nodules. Fluff. Nodules. No, that car's still there at the junction. What is it? A Ferrari? Do you know cars, Ellen? No, not really, no. I'm not a car person at okay, all. Okay, right. We won't go down that rabbit hole. I see you posting, like, your funky old cars. Yeah. And I do think they're really... I look and I think, oh, that's really cool. But yeah. I don't know, like, a ton yeah, of Yeah, yeah, but you know that you... You know good design when you yeah, see it. Yeah, I do. I, but I really like the old, car, like old cars. I like the vintage cars. And sometimes when we're in the US, you see some of the really old Mustangs yeah, and stuff. Yeah. And that is epic. Like yeah, when you see definitely. them, you're like, wow, look at that. It's really cool. But I don't know a great deal about them. I know a bit more about plants. You little turd. <gasps> you just said that. You're just cute. I'm really close to your On face the today. Like, we're hardly ever this close when we record. And I'm like, at real close quarters. <laughs> I don't, too, too close for our like. We're huddling at Gales. I am um, sometimes when I first meet you, like today, mm-hmm. you laugh at me for a little while. <laughs> and I've never, like, in. I think it, we have to have known each other for maybe eight or nine years I don't know, or something, babe. I don't yeah. Know, yeah. But that has that happens every <laughs> single time. I don't know that. And I still haven't nailed why. What's funny just about it? You're cute. <laughs> and you're just walking along, living your life, and it's just cute. <laughs> I can't explain it. <laughs> you're just toddling along, <laughs> and you're usually laughing or doing your kind of a. Uh, Filler laugh in conversations as well. <laughs> We've worked out that you have a filler laugh. You don't fill gaps in conversation with words. You fill it with laugh. It's like <laughs> <laughs> like a kind of segue. You're like a transitional laugher. <laughs> but I do mean it. I generally am not. I don't generally laugh for no reason. Oh, Ellen, do you know what this? Are these plane trees? Yes. Because they. Oh my god, it's coming out that time of year when it really gets in your throat. Oh my god, that Chelsea thing. Oh no. Oh, now I'm not looking. Oh, now I'm not looking forward to Chelsea. Now I've remembered this bloody plane tree thing. Take a um, antihistamine before you go, or the night before. They hook in your mouth, don't they? That's the thing. Yeah, but it really, really helps with the. Oh really? (coughs) And the nose thing. Or a face mask, but that then tells a different story. There are, yeah, it does. They are absolutely beautiful trees. Like, they're so gorgeous. But, like, you're right, I've been sitting here coughing. It's that, yeah. It, <laughs> it makes me do it now, because no. we've said it, but it's, it does. Oh, but, yeah, it's Girls is quietened down a bit now, actually. Well, we were sitting by the door, so we kind of moved over, but this yeah, is better because yeah. it's sunny. It um, is lovely. Tell me what you're up to uh, next week, because I know that it's Next awesome. week? Yeah. Oh, I was going to tell what I've been up to last week because that was awesome. Oh, gosh. <laughs> no, I don't Basically, know. life is awesome. That's no. wonderful. Start from next week. It's just, do you know what, week. though? <laughs> Some last week. It's so funny, though, because probably the same for you, but like from, I don't know, usually beginning of March till end of June is rammed 
because this is kind of when a lot of the shows are a lot of new product trips kind of QVC shows this and that and it's just so intense it just stuff comes up all the time all the time and it's just like oh my god okay so I was in Holland last week and we did the live broadcast for um, that was really cool QVC yeah. which was really really lovely oh my god we're so lucky with the sun honestly it, the day that we were practicing it was so cold it was like dull it wasn't raining but it was really dull yeah and like, i woke up in the morning it was like oh my god this yeah. is just perfect because it wasn't for that yeah. you wouldn't think of it as favorably and everyone's yeah. now saying like all the feedback like, oh it looked amazing it's looked amazing if it was dull even though we'd have pulled it together really well yeah. they wouldn't have said it looked amazing yeah, it wouldn't have looked the same. <laughs> yeah yeah so i just <laughs> i just explained something to you there really obvious didn't i you did. And you were I just been, nodding along. I feel, like, I feel like you just wanted to get that off your chest. Yeah, yeah. It was, Basically, it was it cathartic. Was a, it was a really, really awesome thing to do. Yeah. Like, there's not that many live broadcasts. Yeah. I guess you know, not, no. See, but you yeah, were out yeah. in the field. So it looked really cool. Yeah, yeah. You know, that was... I, that was Interviewing Fan thing. Flower Farm, who've been on the podcast yeah, as well. So yeah. that was cool. And they're so lovely yeah. as well, aren't they? But Linda, can you believe this, is taller than me. Wow, yeah, that's tall, because you're, you're tall. <sighs> To say I was annoyed is an understatement. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I bet women taller. Come crazy. across that many people in I general know. who are taller. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. So for me to look up to someone is kind of weird. Yeah. <laughs> now you know how I feel all yeah, the time. Yeah. Well, look, the cute glamour, cute glamour. So I tell Instagram you, outfit, Instagram outfit. Shall I tell you what the most annoying thing is about being my height? I'm yeah. generally at everyone else's boob height. <laughs> <laughs> So when you're walking in a crowd, my height is like boobs (laughs) everywhere. (laughs) Well, for some that would be lovely. For some, I'm sure it would be. Oh, dear. Uh, And then next week, you're doing something really cool. Okay, well, I'm still telling you about last week, actually. Oh, my Um, God. And then I was just in Holland looking at new products. And the sausage-shaped strawberries, did you see them? I did, yeah. Yeah, lovely, aren't they? Finger strawberries. they look very cool. Uh, No, so anyway, next week, I'm going to be in Italy because I'm judging at the Autocola, which is like, uh, almost like the Chelsea Flower Show in Italy. I think in Milan but you know me Ellen I just agreed to it I'm not even sure what it is <laughs> you just, just rock on up and do what I you're asked that's a nice way to push yourself forward do you know yeah. what I mean just like oh yes that sounds great you get about don't yeah. you eh? and then once you turn up you're kind of like oh this is cool yeah. Yeah. but that's how you need to do stuff isn't it really? just get on just yeah. say yes and challenge yourself and a lot of people oh. are too they put barriers themselves yeah, just, do you it, know, do it, do just do it and it yeah. might be a challenge for you but then when you come out of it you'll go oh wow oh. that was really cool I did that yeah thing. achieved how's your post forest glow uh, my post forest glow is good. Do you know yeah. what? I came away from the retreat and it took me a week or so to kind of uh, think about it. Yeah. If that makes any sense. Process. Like process. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. And I'm really good. So I booked. <coughs> I've booked the next retreat, but it's going to be slightly different because it's more like wellness days. And then I've booked next oh. year's retreat as well, but that will all be announced very soon. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm at Q today, but then Wednesday I'm down at Milan. Oh. At Mil- I said Milan because you said Milan. Malvin. I put off by that woman with the imp- implausibly brown legs. I, I did one. Sorry, yes, I was completely I taken. This morning. Somebody yeah. walked by with very, very, very like, fake yeah. tanned legs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because um, they look different. Different, the other side looked different colour, right? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, that was really check. bad to do that. I had to, to check that. that I saw what I saw. Yeah, I, it's bad to do that. Um, she looks beautiful. So anyway, what happened in Milan? Um, you're, I said Milan, and what I actually meant was Melvin. <laughs> <laughs> that's what those legs. That's what cool. those legs just did to me. Um, but yes, Malvern Malvern. is such a cool show. I'm really looking forward to it. Nice vibe. Though. I know Harrogate is first in yeah. a year, but I very, I think I, I don't have I ever been to Harrogate. I don't think I've you ever actually. been to Harrogate. Let's get you in there. So for me, oh, the, we could get you in there with the Human Gardener. Well, we were, they love you. We were asked to do it yeah. both of us this year. Yeah, we could. But it was it. the weekend of the retreat. Oh uh, yeah, you're right. But so I might do September. Um, yeah. It depends on the date for me. But anyway, yeah, yeah. Um, Melvin, I'll be driving down there on Wednesday. But for me, it's like the first show of the year. Yeah, yeah, and So yeah. it's really exciting. And then I'm hosting the uh, Bloom and Grow Theatre on all days. Oh, We've got some really awesome speakers in there, you know, just all very flowery oh. and beautiful. Jonathan Mosley will oh, be nice there. Cool. Who else? Um, lots of other people will be there. <laughs> Checks notes. <laughs> Carol Klein will be there. Oh, cool. That's oh, cool. um, I think... So I don't want to get muddled between Melvin and BBC Gardeners yeah. World Live by giving you any more names because okay, I get cool. them. You know how you just show up and do it. Yeah, that's kind of the same thing uh-huh, for me, that's right? Cool. Anyway, I'll be hosting <laughs> you that. You don't. You prep well. You prep better I than will, like. I will. I prep. I would, and better than you would admit. But <laughs> I will prep. Yeah. But I'm not going till Wednesday. Mm. 
So I won't. I'm not prepped now. Wednesday this week. I'm, I will leave Wednesday uh, next week. Uh-huh. So I'm not prepped yet, is what I'm saying. She's but in got, the she's got Dylan, is it? In the days running up to it, I will that? prep. Um, yes, I do <laughs> see that. Uh, where would you buy Dylan a Ziploc? Well, maybe she put it in the Ziploc oh, to take yeah. it to someone or oh, yeah. give it to someone. Or maybe she's sharing some dill. Yeah. There you go. Cool. It's nice watching people, isn't it? We like, I do like a bit of people watching, I've so got to Malvern, say. So Malvern, this is cool. Yeah. Ooh. And then what's after Malvern? And then there's Chelsea, like the week yeah. after that. Chelsea cough. <laughs> Which we've already got sitting here. <laughs> so yeah, like the garden season has really kicked off, hasn't cool. it? Looking forward to Chelsea. Um, oh, Chelsea, you know, it's probably... The one place, the one show where there's real prominence to new plants. Yeah. Because you've also got your new plant, the plant of the year. Yeah. It's the one time that new plants get headlines because Ella Mary, I've had a bee in my bonnet recently. That you we have. don't talk about new plants enough. And it's, I did some work with Hillies recently. We had a great chat with Charles Carr and we we're talking about, you know, plants like lavender, hidkirk, kind of this and that. Like, how are they really getting out there? Do the public really know about them? Like the new, newer ones that kind of supersede things like Hidcut, like uh, Phenomenal, Exceptional, kind of a lot of these varieties. And it's, and it's strange because where are all the new plants? Because well, there are so many bred, yeah. but yet people still grow beetroot, boltardi, carrot, early nonce, you know. Like, but people grow what, those what because think? that's what's yeah. available in the garden centres and nurseries. So when all the new breeding happens, why are, they, things, yeah. why are the garden centres not buying those new varieties yeah. in? They're buying what they know the public will buy. Well, I think Do they're know? there, but the public is still choosing the product that's familiar even though there's something out there that you would perform a lot better. You don't often see right? new plants, mm. do you? You don't often see them. Well, they're not showcased centers. enough, Ellen Mary, <laughs> on TV. I, okay. That's the thing as well. In general. Like, well, when you see like the gardening programs, they will still talk about plants like Hidka and this and that because I think there's a kind of disconnect with... Uh, this guy's really cute. Um, I think there's a real disconnect with kind of like they then, the programs maybe would feel that they were then promoting the new plants and giving the marketing a helping hand, which they kind of would dis- disagree with doing, which yeah. is then, that's why new plants are never pushed out there. So kind of like the English TV programs are kind of far too gentle when it comes to innovation and new plants. But I don't know if you've ever seen the um, the Dutch TV program, the gardening program. No. It's called uh, The Groot Toon Verbouwing which means uh, the big garden and building outside or something like that. Nice. And it's presented by a team with uh, this guy, Rob, Rob Verlinden. And it is so commercial. It's almost like too commercial in the other way because nice. every program is sponsored by products or plants. Nice. So it's real product placement. And sometimes you'll see them like plant up like, oh, the other day they were putting some Kinomelis, uh, Shinomelis, Kinomelis, yeah. uh, kind of towards the front of the border, kind of like, oh, to showcase it because it was a new plant. I was kind of thinking, this is kind of not really going to work here. So it's kind of a bit too far the other way. But I feel like our programs could be a little bit more, yeah. not advertorial, but just show new plants. Well, just striking a Showcase balance, new plants, yeah, yeah But exactly. also, that's a wonderful opportunity, you know, for you, Michael. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, no, but also, then I kind of bounced back to Hillier and I was like, well, I know about all these new plants, but we really need to get them in the hands of the influencers. And a really great guy that I was chatting to the other day, I had that Hidcoat conversation. And so I think I'm going to um, turn up at his door with some phenomenal plants or something, you know, because this is where the new plants need to be so they can see the proof in the pudding, yeah. as it were. So, yeah, I get that. Yeah, I feel a crusade coming on. Um, I need a hashtag. <laughs> well, let's make one up now. Yeah? Hashtag... <clears throat> new for you. New, no. That's no. actually a saying on something, like a well-being thing. It's like a saying on a tampon. New, oh my goodness. New for you. Pl- yeah. um, okay. Do you like that dog? That's your sort of dog. Oh, that's yeah. a beautiful dog. That's an Instagram it's a dog. fluffy. <laughs> um, <laughs> Did she hear me say that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's an Instagram it's dog. It's an Instagram. <laughs> oh. Yeah, okay. Carry on. Um, we could get our listeners to decide on a hashtag. Yes, exactly. That would be really cool. Exactly. How can we get the new plant movement going? Yeah, to get people to embrace new plants, yeah. stop growing the old. It's not about Try completely ignoring new. old stuff, but just grow something better that performs, that makes you feel like a better gardener as well. It makes you feel like you've got green fingers, yeah. you know? There we know. go. Well, there Michael go. is on a crusade, so yeah. there we go. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <clears throat> okay. Is that it? Are we done? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I was really excited about what was on this uh, trolley. The problem is we're looking around at all the people and all the things at the same time. Aren't Look we? at all that milk. Rich yolk. What's that? 
rich yolk. Egg yolks. Rich yolk. Yeah, I guess. Is it a box of egg yolks? Is it? No. <laughs> anyway, great and happy coronation. Yeah, happy. We're actually, we must just say we're sitting underneath all of like the Union Jacks and and there's a little floral display. So yeah. In queue. Happy coronation if you if you you know support that. I always get muddled up with Q and Q QVC. Q. <laughs> Never sure QVC where I'm going. Q, Q or QVC. All right. Well, you have to shoot off to Paddington, and I'm going to walk. Yeah, I do. Q, so. Cool. Lovely Thank to you. see you, Ellen. You Thank too. you for making the time. <laughs> That was a laugh filler. I was going to say, that's exactly what I just did. Now I recognise doing it. So now it's time for your exclusive Zest Outdoor Living discount code. Choose from the beautiful range of sustainable timber garden furniture, grow your own and decorative structures, all designed with style, comfort and longevity in mind. Use the code PLANTBASED25 at checkout on the website zestoutdoorliving.co.uk. That's PLANTBASED25 for a huge 25% discount off Zest Grow Your Own and Planters Range, available Available until the 31st of May 2023. The discount code excludes already discounted or sale items. Happy gardening! So we've got homework again for you this week and this is a right royal plant fest <laughs> did you like that especially for the coronation yeah so let us know if you can name any plants that have a royal connection maybe it's very obvious and it's their name or maybe there's a story about the plant yes sorry <laughs> again distracted by noise um i've got a story to tell you first Go on then. the bishop's house garden in norwich has a really beautiful big I'm get, I'm pretty sure it's yeah. a hebe, but it was grown from a sprig that was taken from Queen Victoria's oh. wedding bouquet. Yeah. And so, cuttings can be taken of that and then given to other residents, like bishops and royals, uh, ooh, uh. and then they're used in other bouquets in royal family. Uh -huh. So that's just a story rather than a plant. So Caroline, uh, photographer Caroline got plant of that in her garden I think she has not that hebe right? but she's got a different one uh -huh. or she... a myrtle she's got a myrtle right myrtle yeah. maybe it was, oh maybe it was a myrtle yes. I'm sure it was a hebe either way one or the cool. other very cool but isn't that cool to think that a plant is yeah. still growing yeah. from a cutting uh -huh. taken from very Queen Victoria's cool. bouquet have you got a plant with a royal name uh, there's a good way to call Prince Charles isn't there a lovely kind of pale blue colour one I believe a rose no, a clematis. Oh, a clematis. Ah, yeah. oh, okay. Can you Google oh, it while you're just, talking. That's just reminded me. There's some fuchsias also yeah. named after um, uh -huh. Princess Charlotte. Yeah. Um, there's a I rose. Think I named them. Actually, they. We yes. named a chrysanthemum. They were in the Princess Thompson Charlotte. and yeah. Morgan show garden at Jimmy's farm. Yes, that's where I see, first saw them. It's my fault. A lot of this stuff. That was, <laughs> that was about nine years ago. Uh -huh. That's um, where we first met. Darling. Yeah, it was, wasn't it? That's cool. <laughs> so, um. There's a rose King Charles coronation, which um, yes. has obviously been named and brought out for the coronation. So, yeah, let us know uh, or show us any pictures of any royal plants yeah. that you know or you grow. Yeah, social media and tag us in Defo. at Plant Based Podcast, <laughs> hashtag Plant Based Podcast, and let's check out your plants. Cool.com. Thank you all for listening to this week's episode of the Plant Based Podcast. Be sure to check out our sponsor, Stonely Wines. Their premium wines in New Zealand are made from 100% sustainably sourced grapes and is vegan certified also. Our favourite Stonely Sauvignon Blanc displays fresh and vibrant aromas of passion fruit and citrus with crisp notes. We have our exclusive discount code for 20% off Stonely Sauvignon Blanc exclusively on Amazon using the code STONELY20. The music for the Plump Ace podcast is part of the song Grow by Mikey James and our editor is Gareth Patch of Semi-Echo. Semi-Echo.